I think we might just get started. We might kick off. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and and uh, thank you for joining us today for this very important conversation to explore the Indian market opportunity. Um, today's webinar has been brought to you by Austrade and Trade and Investment um, Queensland. I'm Smriti Sharma, um, and I'm part of the Austrade team. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the various lands from which we're all working today. Um, and I'd like to extend my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have also joined today's webinar. Um, I'd like to go around and introduce uh, each of the presenters and panelists that we have today. Uh, firstly, we've got Abhinav Patia, who is the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner at uh, Trade and Investment Queensland. We have Paula Guino, from, who is Head of Technology and Health at Austrade. Uh, Amanda Russell, who is the tra Senior Trade and Investment Officer from Trade and Investment Queensland. That's a mouthful there. Um, Paul Kang has just joined us, um, who is Co-Founder and Director at Entersoft. We have Janendra Kara, Senior Advisor from Redland City Council, and we have Shiraz Engineer, um, who is the Associate Director, Strategy and Capability and Head of Academy Programs at AsiaLink. Um, thank you all, thank you to all the presenters and panelists for joining us today. Uh, before we kick off the agenda, I want to share a quote from an article that I read recently. Um, and the article was about ANZ's presence in India, which dates back to 1984 and now includes 7,500 uh, staff in the Bengaluru office. So the quote is by Shane Elliott, who said, we've been in India for a long time. We really do sense that this is the beginning of a new chapter for growth. India is the future. And if you're a global business like us, you can't not be here. I think that that um, quote drives home the significance of the Indian market opportunity and today's conversation. And so with that, I'd like to hand over to Abhinav to speak about the opportunities. Share your presentation, Abhinav. Oh. <clears throat> Smithy, will you be sharing or yeah. do you want me to okay. share? Okay, great. I can, I can share for you. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to speak with you that why the India opportunity matters as Smriti introduced. Uh, I'm the commissioner with Trained and Investment Queensland uh, based out of Bangalore. My team's mandate is to uh, handle the entire South Asia region. We have an office for 19 years here in Bangalore and we are adding another one in Mumbai very shortly, so we are expanding and uh, growing fast. I thought I'll spread my 10 minutes, next 10 minutes on three important things that the India story, that why it should matter to you, some of it Smriti touched upon, uh, the relationship between India and Australia and the digital economy that we want to focus on. But I am conscious that we have companies from various sectors today, a uh, large number of them are from digital space, others are in mining equipment technology as well and few other sectors, which is great. We are happy to provide support uh, across sectors there. Usually when I start anything in India, Australia corridor, uh, I start with cricket, uh, but uh, the way India played the World Test Championship final against Australia, I don't have much to say. In fact, someone uh, wrote in one of the newspapers that the only thing common between Australian kangaroos and Indian cricket team was that both jump around, but only one gets caught. So I'm really hoping that we're going to have a much better performance in the upcoming World Cup when India hosts the World Cup in October, November, and uh, uh, the Australian team and rest of the uh, global teams will come over to India for the match. So why India <clears throat> and the why it should matter to you? Uh, Smriti, if you could go to... Uh, the next slide and slide after that where the data is provided, slide number three. While Smithy brings is that up. Right, is this the right slide? Um, nothing is moving in on my screen. Oh. Um, I've moved over to the next slide. Let me try and reset that. 
Okay, no worries. So uh, I thought why India matters, I should tell you in the next uh, uh, three different uh, pillars of the Indian economy, the economic pillar, the social pillar, and the political pillar that is on your screen now. <clears throat> India is already the fifth largest economy in the world, but in last 10 years, what all has happened and what all you may not have noticed because you may not been to India or you may have heard stories that, oh, too complex, very difficult market. We won't be able to tap into it. All of that is true. It is complex. It is difficult. It is confusing, but it's not a market that can be ignored by anyone. <clears throat> so in last 10 years alone, India's GDP has crossed Russia, Canada, Italy, France, Brazil and UK to become the fifth largest economy in the world. In last 10 years, there has been 2x rise in highway connectivity, 3x rise in bank account connectivity, 3x rise in airline network, 50x, 50, 50 times rise in broadband connectivity. And just to put this in perspective, what does all these numbers mean? India is building 16.7 kilometers of highway network every day on every single day basis. That means a road distance between Sydney and Perth getting added to India's highway every eight months. So that's how India, how, how fast India is integrating, the scale at which it is in, integrating, and the growth in GDP reflects that. India, when it got independence in 1947, took 67 years to reach $1 trillion economy, US $1 trillion, 67 years. Next trillion dollars came in eight years. And the third trillion came in five years. Now you see how the, the rate at which India is growing and the scale at which India is growing, when the world is looking at a, a recession or a zero or a one or a 2% growth, India with this base, with this size is going at six, 7% uh, uh, GDP growth. And that's where the macro picture is that the economy is growing at a rapid pace. Another figure that I find very fascinating is since uh, independence 1947 to now, India has attracted $950 billion worth of FDI. So big companies putting metal in the ground, factories, big offices, Apple, Google, Facebook coming here. Out of that $950 billion in the last 77 years, $550 billion came in the last eight years. So global companies are seeing that growth story, they're seeing that talent availability and they're putting their money. So should we, so should we look at the market? I'm not saying everybody is going to be successful here. You come here and you're going to get millions of dollars of deal, not going to happen. Likely you will be here months and months. You'll be frustrated and think, oh, they were talking about massive market, but nothing is working out for me. So it's going to be a slow grind. It will be painful, but it's a market that's going to give you dividends for next 30, 40, 50 years. And that's where the social pillar comes in. Even with the most populous country in the world with 1.42 billion people, the average age of India is 29 years. There are a billion people under the age of 35 India will be the youngest country all the way up till 2070. And Boston Consulting Group did a study that every Indian born after 2000, year 2000, is going to spend $240,000 in their lifetime. Uh, and that you multiply with 1.4 billion people, you get the market size available in India. That's the size of the opportunity. And the, why the political pillar is so important that Australia for the longest time had placed a lot of its eggs in too few bucket, baskets. And when COVID happened, certain countries decide to shut down their trade access with Australia. The trade just fell off the cliff. That's not going to happen with a country like India because it's a democratic country like Australia. There are 960 million registered voters in India. 600 million actually casted vote in the last elections. And most interesting point, 90 million are new voters. So they are holding government accountable that you cannot decide our destiny based on how the leaders have their relationship. The, the relationship between countries should be based on common values, common growth, common respect. And that's where I'm very hopeful that India is going to expand its relationship with Australia much beyond cricket. It's going to grow to actual political, economic, trade relationship. And free trade agreement is a, a proof of that. India and Australia were talking about free trade agreement for 11, 12 years, Smithy. And nothing was moving. And when 
the the COVID stuck, and then there is a realization that we need to Asia Pacific needs to work better. Two of the most interesting economies need to work better. Better, the free trade agreement got signed in eight months. That's a record. No country in the world has been able to sign an agreement with India that far, especially a developed economy like Australia. So it's it's phenomenal what Australia has achieved in terms of access for. Australian companies into India, 85-90% of all Australian goods are now duty-free into India, services are duty-free into India, and same with Indian companies coming into Australia. Uh, Smithy, if you can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I, I often talk about uh, this, that do, I, I'm paid to talk about India. Queensland government has hired me to uh, manage India, so I will, of course, talk about uh, India Economist magazine is not paid by Queensland government or Australian government. It's an in independent, respected journal, sp respected magazine. So they came up with a uh, a cover story a few months back on India's moment, where they did a very critical analysis on what is the what is going right in India, and irrespective of what political class will do, India growth story is going to continue. It's a very good critique of what is going right, what can go wrong. So if anybody is actually interested in understanding India's dynamics, this would be a great six, seven pages. They will tell you far more than I can tell you in six days. So do read that. The map on your right, India map is also fascinating. What, what we have done here is replaced all of the state's names with countries' name around the world, uh, reflecting their economic GDP. So the GDP of Singapore is equivalent to GDP of Maharashtra on your middle left. The GDP of Uttar Pradesh is equivalent to the GDP of Qatar. So it's not one market, it's 28, 29, nine markets rolled into one. And so is the diversity of what you sell in South of India, the way you sell in South of India is gonna be very different from where you sell in North of India. So it's gonna be a difficult market to understand. And that's where the support from agencies like TIQ that that have offices, Austrade uh, that have many more offices, I think nine offices in India with 70 member team, they are there to provide support to Queensland and all Australian companies. Uh, and Smithy, the last slide uh, from my side is a, another interesting study that World Economic Forum did. And if you see India's economic prosperity was a pyramid with a very big low income base, lower middle income base in 2005. In 2018, that pyramid is turned into oblique where the higher income and upper mid is growing rapidly. But the exciting part is coming as we speak. In 2030, the forecast is India will have 29 million high income households, 29 million households. Australia's population is 25, 26 million, so 29 million households with high income. Upper mid will be 168 million households. And that's where the need for high class services, products from Australia will come in. And that what makes us very excited. So as Queensland, we launched a Queensland India strategy two weeks back, which had very specific funding programs to encourage companies to come into India. There are specific sectors that we are focusing on. So I encourage you to read that strategy and get in touch with Amanda to uh, uh, talk to us about how your company can benefit from that strategy, that funding, that money that is put on the table to support uh, Queensland companies. On the digital slide, I'll just take one minute because I know there are people who are far more knowledgeable on digital economy than I am. Uh, but India's main growth story, for example, China started as a manufacturing play. Uh, that's where all the prosperity in China came in. In India, everything came in on the digital side, on the IT technology side. There are more than 5 million people employed in the technology sector. Five out of the top 10 IT services companies in the world, top 10, are based here in India. And the most exciting prospect, one is to selling into this growing high high income and upper middle, upper middle income class to sell your product services here to them either directly or indirectly. But more importantly, what the digital economy in India gives you access. And I saw that in action is that companies going to Queensland companies, going to companies like Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, saying that 
we have a cybersecurity solution that can help your banking clients uh, do the KYC faster and reduce the turnaround time by 80%. And Infosys, TCS, using that solution into their clients in Europe, North America, uh, South America. So India became a gateway, not just to the India market, but to the global market. So that is a massive opportunity. These companies have specific teams on open innovation where they're looking for technology that they can implement in India and to their global clients. So I'll stop here, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation or whenever Smriti feels is the right time. But uh, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Abhinav. Those, um, those statistics that you presented are eye-watering and the, the demographics, uh, sorry, the, the um, infographics are very interesting. I've never seen that map before um, presented in that way. But also you pointed out that India is a complex market, right? And so with that, I'd like to hand over to Amanda to talk about some of the support programs within TIQ. Thanks, Smriti, um, and thanks everyone for attending today. Um, so I sit within the Health Innovation and Technology team here at um, Trade and Investment Queensland's head office in Brisbane. Uh, we work both with Queensland exporters in these sectors, but also with international companies looking to invest in Queensland in these sectors. We're a team of seven um, and we're split, split down the side um, with health, um, which includes clinical, tri clinical trials, research, biomanufacturing, diagnostics, med tech and medical devices and digital health on one side. And then uh, the side that I sit on, which is innovation and tech, which is platform and enabling technology such as drones, robotics, AI, immersive technology um, and cybersecurity and digital technologies, including software as a service, uh, FinTech, HR tech, prop tech, enterprise tech, sports tech, digital games, and transport technologies. So we have a very diverse portfolio, but a very exciting portfolio. Um, and we get to work across all the international markets um, where TIQ has an office. So we work really closely with all of our overseas offices and act as a conduit to them. Um, our role here um, working with the Queensland companies is to really ensure that they're export ready and market ready. Um, and we also then maintain capability um, documents so we can feed relevant overseas opportunities to you as they come available where it is a match for your capability. Uh, we service Queensland exporters on a bespoke um, model and that's really dependent on what stage the company is at and the type of support that they are looking for. Um, as part of our service offering, um, we also have a couple of flagship grant programs which is what I wanted to speak to you today. Um, so the two programs that we have, one is named Go Global and one is New Export, uh, sorry, New to New Market um, Program. Go Global is currently open um, and it is designed to provide export ready um, companies with financial support to cover um, eligible costs in terms of finalising a sale into a new market. This includes expenses such as advisory services and tools, um, external costs of product testing and redesign to um, deliver on that deal, external costs for regulatory compliance and certification, um, and any external costs with product approvals, installation, training, operations and maintenance required for that new client um, in that new market. So TIQ under that program is able to provide match funding of up to $25,000 to support el eligible projects. Um, Currently, we have Go Global open, and I'm pleased to say that we do have a focus on both applicants that have a sports tech focus and also applicants relevant to this group um, that are taking place in India. So applications remain open until the 11th of September. So if you'd like to find out more, please don't hesitate to reach out to either me or if you have an existing TRQ client manager, your client manager, um, uh, and we can have a further conversation about that. I also wanted to flag our new market program, which um, won't open until probably the first quarter of next year. But that one is designed for existing exporters to explore new opportunities in new markets. So this is really great for exporters who've maybe done some work in New Zealand or the US and UK and are now looking at exploring opportunities in India. Um, this one um, eligible funding is more linked to your typical business development costs. So it's um, eligible expenses include participation at trade fairs and international conferences, costs of um, 
promotional materials or engaging an in-market representative to do some business development or market research for you. Again, similar to Go Global, this is match funding up to $25,000. Um, and yeah, that one will open in March next year. So keep those in mind. Uh, feel free to reach out if any of those um, pick your interest or if you'd rather, or if you'd also like to have a conversation about going into India, we'd be more than happy to have a chat. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and so these TIQ programs obviously go in hand with programs at the federal level. And um, Paula, I'll hand over to you, please, to talk about Austrade's offerings. Thank you so much. Um, it was really great to hear from Abhinav and, and how excited. I mean, I, I feel like the opportunity is 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 huge and it's really great to see just some of that data um, on the screen. But for Austrade, um, you know, we work um, across all markets. Um, uh, India is a, is a big focus, um, but we also work hand in hand with TIQ. So it's important, I think, for, you know, for businesses that are really looking at um, going into an, a new market that you actually um, make sure that you do reach out to, to both organizations so that you can get the most from both. So there will be, you know, grants that will be, that will be offered at a state level and then at a, at a federal level as well. Um, but most important, is the servicing that we provide to the companies. So I lead the health and, and technology teams. But of course, at Austrade, we also have, you know, we work across all different sectors. So resources and energy, um, infrastructure, um, agri and food. Um, so you can, you can, you can get assistance based on what you're aiming um, to do. And most importantly, what we do is to, you know, spend some time um, talking to, to the companies and really trying to understand what your next steps would be in regards to uh, the market that you want to, to approach. Um, and with Austrade, so we have um, more than 60 offices um, offshore as well. So that means that, you know, going into into you know each of those markets is where we can actually provide you with some support but most importantly it's where you're going to get some um market intelligence um some business matching as well um there there are some activities such as conferences and you know and, and trade delegations um but we do work on a on a one-to-one -one basis where we can really um you know if you reach out to us we will really put you in contact with um with a team member, either onshore or offshore, that will be able to guide you through um, your plans. I think most importantly, um, in regards to why India, I think Abhinav has already, um, you know, talked a lot about that. But India, India is often seen as a as a complex as a complex market, um, and scale ups look to traditional markets like the US and Europe. That's what we mostly see in technology is you know companies coming to us, really aiming um, for for the for the traditional markets. But it's important to really understand um, the scale of India. Um, and and how much can be done. Of course, there will be complexities, but as you work with TIQ um, and with Austrade as well, we will help you um, navigate through that process. Um, I won't cover the market and the economy since that's been done. So from a global tech hub perspective, perspective um, there is, you know, a, a deep digital um, penetration. Um, it, we, we do have, so there is a lot of um, initiatives that will be done, you know, not just by the Indian government, you know, attracting companies to the market, but also the Australian government and then some joint um, initiatives as well. Um, India is increasingly becoming a global hub for tech and innovation. Um, in in financial year 2022, India's technology industry recorded 15.5% growth. That's the highest ever um, in revenue. And by 2025, it is expected that its digital economy will be worth $1 trillion. So that's, that's huge. Um, the key to this growth um, has been a combination of factors, including, you know, the government initiatives that I just mentioned, um, a, a large pool of tech talent uh, with several world class education institutions producing graduates in fields such as computer science and engineering, a large user base and high digital penetration rate um, with the increase of smartphones and affordable data plans. Um, has created a large market for digital services, including e-commerce, digital payments, and online entertainment. And every global tech company um, hopes for a fertile market and secure business, and that's where India rules um, the demand of top technology companies. 
Um, in regards to the innovation and startup ecosystem, um, India's startup scene is buzzing, as you know, you've heard from, from many of us, um, being the world's third largest startup economy and also um, crossed the 100 uh, unicorn mark in 2022. Bangalore remains the largest startup hub in India, while Delhi and Mumbai uh, were the second and third largest. Fostering global advancements in sectors like renewable energy, AI and quantum and a high level of innovation and government initiatives, um, such as the Startup India program, will further promote entrepreneurship and create a conducive ecosystem for startups. So I think most importantly, um, the takeaways from you know, the discussions to date will be you know, the, it is a huge market. Ask the questions. We do have teams, so TIQ and Austrade have teams onshore and offshore that can actually guide you uh, through that process. Um, and most importantly, is just really taking advantage of all the initiatives and grants that are available. So um, I'm sure the contacts for, for everyone on the call, or my contacts can be shared at the end of the call. So if anyone wants to reach out, um, I'm happy to answer any questions directly as well. Thank you, Paula. Um, I would like to now move into the, the panel discussion and I'll ask Paul, um, Shiraz and Janendra, um, just to, if you could just speak for a couple of minutes to give the audience a very quick background on your connections to India, and then we'll move into the panel discussion. Super, thanks, Smriti. Happy to kick it off. So my name is Shiraz Engineer, and I'm the Associate Director with AsiaLink Business. Uh, my, my connection with India primarily has been around, uh, grew up, uh, worked in the market for, uh, for a number of years, uh, worked across both private sectors as well with multinationals. I'll refer to it as the unorganized sector where I worked for a proprietor over there, uh, looking to import products from, from China, but a lot of my experience has really been with banking in financial services, multinationals like Dell, uh, and then for the last 15 odd years in Australia, um, and of the last five, specifically with Asia Link Business, working with organizations as part of their growth strategies, looking at, at Asia and India specifically. Thank you. Paul, would you mind giving a quick intro? Sure thing. Uh, yeah, Paul Kang, um, co-founder of Entersoft, a cybersecurity company uh, focusing on securing applications, so web apps and mobile apps APIs. Um, I'm actually of Indian origin. Uh, name doesn't really sort of fit the background of one, but I was born in Australia. Parents migrated about 35 years ago. Um, in terms of India, I, I, I guess my journey from a business point of view started in 20, 2014. Where I met my business partner um, in Bang Bangalore and we've established a team of 50 plus security engineers out of Bangalore and Hyderabad. Uh, for me, it's really um, it's a great place in terms of culture, food. Uh, it's a very diverse diverse geography. The north to the south is very different, um, and in terms of opportunity as well, it's very exciting. Uh, I think there's a lot of promise going forward, and looking forward to sort of tap into that um, in the next few questions. Thank you. Over to you, Janendra. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, so nice to be here uh, addressing this uh, August gathering. I uh, My connect to India um, dates back. I, I was born and brought up there in the east part of India. After, I think, 20 years, I moved to north part of India, working for the largest automobile company there in India for 13 years. Then I moved to west part of India, where I was working with Austrade for over nine years, and then we chose to migrate to Australia. So India still remains uh, uh, a very uh, fond uh, place to work, and I, I try to help companies uh, who would like to work with India. Great, thank you. Um, into the the panel question. So I'll uh, direct the first question to you, Shiraz. In what way does the tech market in India differ from other global markets, and what unique opportunities does it present for Australian companies? Perfect. Thanks, Ruthie. And could I just also acknowledge what Paula uh, mentioned on 
on unicorns and over a hundred unicorns spot on. Um, Abhinav, your point on, uh, you know, you can't treat India as, uh, you know, a, a homogenous market and rolled up into one. And, you know, it is true. India is a market that is so diverse and therein lies part of its complexities, but also the success, you know, when organizations understand how they can actually navigate it. And a simple term that I've seen used once before is many Indias in India. That's how you need to think about, you need to think about India. It's not, you know, people get caught up with 1.4 billion consumers and I'm like, no, which of those 1.4 billion are you going to go after? Because that's not it. You've already lost if you think that's your market or all of India is your market. You need to be specific and understand where. And then from a technology spec, you know, perspective, when we think about the opportunities and why and how it's different from other countries, it's just that the scale, the sectors that it crosses over, uh, I'm going to go with, there aren't many countries that can offer that same level, the same level of scale that India does across those multiples. But you almost need to take a little bit of a step back when we think about India's growth in the technology sector, which really, if you think about it, really began in more in the 90s when India emerged as a major IT player uh, within those days, but more the outsourcing industry. But it quickly established, you know, back in that 1950s and 60s, 60s with the education focus when we when we uh, established what was referred to as the Indian Institute of Technology or IITs back in 50s, 60s. You know, that's when India was really able to sort of tap into that large pool of skilled professionals and then thinking about those skilled professionals with high skill labor, competitive costing, and of course, that shared language of English, you know, India really did become a really attractive location for multinational companies to do business. Um, and of course, the startup ecosystem, which I know has been talked about, but uh, and we got some really interesting stats earlier, but if you really think of it going back 2010, yes, India did have a really strong focus with the, you know, software as a service and platforms and, you know, operating on low cost alternative technologies. And that was one of the areas that were really distinct from other, other parts of the world. But since then, India has continued to step up. And this is the part that becomes really exciting with when you look at, you know, whether you look at Harvard uh, Business Review links and things like that, you know, they talk about the homegrown unicorns and, you know, Paula, you mentioned over a hundred spot on. But even if you look at India Brand Equity Foundation and they talk about how back in 2014, just 2014, so we're not even 10 years, uh, India had 350 startups. Fast forward 2023, we've close to like it's upwards of 80 I mean, the numbers said 88, I'll be conservative and say 85, upwards of 85,000 startups, 2023. So under 10 years, you're already there. You've called out sectors like e-commerce, health, fintech, edtech, you know, they're all out there. But I'd, I'd also, Paul, Paula, Paula, you did mention um, the Startup India program, but it's important to recognize initiatives that the government is taking to help propel this innovation ecosystem. So whether it is Startup India, Digital India, they're all continuing to uh, contribute to, to the growth story and the innovation ecosystem that we're seeing in, in India. And then of course, if you think of you know, health tech, uh, specifically within what's called the National Digital Health Mission that's been set up, sole aim really of their digitizing, standardizing healthcare systems, and really what they're looking to do is boost capacity and remove efficiencies and facilitate healthcare. And that is part of where those opportunities lie for Australian businesses that are strong in these sectors. But I always go in, know where, uh, you know, if it's agribusiness, understand where in agribusiness, uh, Abhinav said, how you do business in, and where you're doing business in the South is going to be so different to whether it's the North or in the East. So you really need to understand your value proposition as well and how you'll tailor it. I might leave my opening comments over there and move to another speaker and we can uh, unpack this as we go through. Thank you. Those again, very interesting statistics. And as you say, the ecosystem is ripe um, and just the opportunities for Australian companies are endless. 
Um, over to you, Janendra. Uh, could you share your experience on working in India and some, discuss some of the challenges that you've encountered? Yeah, thank you, Shruti. Uh, of course, uh, as Abhinav and Shiraj and everyone has alluded, like it's massive country, diverse culture, different ways of working. Uh, it, it's pretty overwhelming for the Australian company uh, to understand how India works and probably couldn't emphasize more the competition like Siraj alluded, like the startups have grown to 85,000 or upwards to that. So the tech industry is experiencing no doubt a rapid growth with local players becoming more and more competitive. So Australian company should have some unique value proposition which they can stand out with so i think that could be a challenge in an opportunity as well if if there is a, there is a challenge there is an opportunity as uh, uh, i think uh, you know rightly said that companies like tcs and all others will find a niche and then integrate in their product and sell to other markets so probably there is that thing and pricing could be another challenge uh, india is is really a price sensitive market it's crucial to determine the right prices for your offering that uh, involves careful selecting price point that match the value of customer which customer perceive good given that india's population is larger than australia even the prices are lower in india the overall cost would still be advantages for Australian companies, so probably they will have to work on their pricing strategy a lot. Then cultural and language differences, uh, as others uh, mentioned, like India is rich tapestry of diverse cultural language and ways of life. Uh, to thrive in this environment, it's invaluable to cultivate positive work conditions and connections to familiarize yourself. So investing in time in India is, I think, a key because uh, most of the time we don't realize that uh, spending time in India, the way it works is building the relations, network and connections. Probably Indians would uh, uh, like to know the counterpart better. So it alludes to another uh, interesting point that the the Indians would like to know the partners better and they will like to spend more time uh, uh, taking them out in dinner for instance or asking about a lot of small talks small talks uh, not necessarily is is anything bad but they would like to find that common connection how how they can connect with the audience and and then work together and I think that's a very good step to understand each other so yeah, uh, there are challenges, but then there are opportunities uh, as well. And uh, I can't emphasize more that Austrid and TIQ has the fabulous network on ground. So probably they can they can help to navigate different challenges. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time, so probably there are several other challenges, but I think these are the top challenges I can think of. Yeah, thank you, Janendra. And as you say, I think this is just the beginning of that conversation. Um, and, you know, we will obviously put all of our details of, um, in the chat and urge uh, the audience to reach out to us to build on that conversation. You touched on a very important point about pricing, and I'm wondering, Paul, if that was something that you've also um, encountered, you know, with the current focus on the Australia-India um, strategic relationship, we have seen a huge rise in the number of Australian businesses um, that are seeking to access India. And you mentioned that you've been in India for, from a business perspective for almost 10 years. Um, what advice would you give to Australian companies um, on market access consideration, perhaps pricing or the product market fit? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, in terms of with anything in terms of expanding overseas or into any market, I think research is number one and really understanding the market that you're wanting to tap into. Uh, and if there is a product market fit, like what problem are you solving? Is there a pain point? Is there actually a requirement? Um, can you identify a customer who can potentially take up, take up your product or service? Um, definitely from a pricing point, we, we have encountered, um, it's not an easy hurdle, but I, I think it's just looking at the sheer volume and magnitude of opportunity that's available. Pricing, yes, um, it is very different for us in India in terms of what it is. It is um, globally and in other Western markets, but that's just in, in, in terms of, I guess, the number of competitors or a number of companies who are potentially offering the similar service. 
But it also comes down to education as well, educating your customer on are you different, what service you're providing, and whether they see value. So, so with anything, I, I think it's covering a number of points and addressing those and understanding whether, whether there is appetite. Um, for us, like I, I guess from a personal point of view and in terms of running the business, like the amount of talent that's there, the work ethic, um, it, it's just exceptional. Um, and the ability to to want to do more and learn and grow um, the loyalty side of things. I think in, in the last sort of 10 years, um, the retention from our side is literally, uh, I think over the 10 years we've had one employee who left last year because we were moving um, to Europe and we just couldn't accommodate that. And um, hopefully we get them back, but it's, it's these sort of factors which um, make it such a great place. So whether you're setting up um, a team in India, or whether you're tapping into the market there, uh, there's opportunities on both sides. I think one of the challenges um, for us is no direct flights. Uh, it'd be great to see direct flights from Brisbane to any city in India, um, but hopefully, I, I think that should be on the radar soon. A, a couple of other things that I sort of just read read up about was um, is quite surprising. Is there's going to be close to one billion. Um, internet users by 2025. So if you're a tech company and that's your market, like there is this, the sheer scale of that in terms of numbers is huge and you're not going to find that anywhere else. Um, uh, one of the other things, it's English rule of law. Um, so it's quite similar to Australia. Um, we're, we're heavily focused from a cybersecurity perspective. We work heavily in the sort of financial services, fintech, um, insurance space. So once again, it's in the last sort of three to five years, there's been a massive um, growth in the fintech space. Uh, we touched on unicorns before. Um, so just diving a bit deeper into those numbers, uh, back in 2019, there were seven unicorns in India. And I think that number's gone to, uh, I think like 108 now. So just the growth that we've seen in four years and just imagine that growth in, in the next sort of three to five years as well. Um, so, so yeah, those sort of things make it very exciting. I think with anything for any business, if, if you're looking to expand into a new market, you have to you have to build relationships. You have to spend time there. Nothing's easy. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, that's a really good point about spending time there. I think uh, with a market like India, I heard somebody say it has to be a full body immersion. You can't just sit and dip your toes in. Um, you really have to throw yourself into it. And um, I will touch on that uh, at the end of, towards the end of this session. Um, but moving on, Shiraz, um, over to you. Can you please provide your view on the cultural aspects and the business etiquettes that Australian businesses should be aware of um, when they're accessing or operating in India? Super, thanks, Smriti. Um, and again, I've actually just come off two sessions today, each for two hours where we've been de dealing on business culture and I do a whole day session on just that. So I will do my best in trying and summing it up. But uh, uh, Paul, you mentioned a really important point on relationships and, and understanding that. And I think one of the simplest thing is, you know, connect with your business partners, you know, connect with your teams, use something as simple as WhatsApp on your mobile phones. I always go with like, that's the, that's one of the easiest things you can do. Everyone's on WhatsApp. But just more from a business perspective uh, and business culture, there is no one one way Indians work. You've got people, you've got individuals who could be from your Indian Institute of Management, technologies, they could have studied overseas, they could have an international experience. So just because you hear someone's from India doesn't necessarily mean they'll be completely indirect with you or they won't say, you know, you're like, oh yeah, they said yes. No, you're dealing with me, I am super direct. So, you know, it's just one of those things where you can't just you can't just say someone's from India, therefore they're going to be they're going to be indirect in the way they approach things. You have to understand there are a number of things at play. Um, I was recently working uh, working with a, an Indian tech company and an Australian tech company, and just the pace at which the 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 Indian side wanted to get things done, and you know, like saying, "Hey, let's do a pilot, let's test it out." And I could see the Australians are going, oh, wait a minute, let me get the contract in place. Oh, what about IP? And they're like, hey, it's a pilot. Let's just test it. What's, you know, like, let's get, let's get, let's move. And you could have just seen the Australians just not ready, just not ready for that pace. And then you hear all these stories of, you no, know, the Indian side will take a lot of time. And I'm just like, it's amazing to see this. And this was literally last month. 
when this was happening. But I will say from a business side, be respectful. Uh, yes, you've got founders that might have that experience. So, but irrespective of anything, you know, it's always being respectful, understand who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a more traditional firm, um, uh, you know, and it's not a startup, it's not a tech startup, not in the FinTech space, just be aware that, you know, hierarchy could have uh, an impact. And the best thing you can do is actually, you know, speak to the local people on the ground. So speak with your local team. So whether it's the, the TIQ team who are on the ground over there, or people like Abhinav, or speak with the, the local or trade teams that you have over there to get that sense of who you're engaging with, what's that best approach that we need to take. So that is one of the key things that I would always say. And then the last, and I'll keep this over here, is just because of the way hierarchy plays out is something simple you can do and practical is just make sure, you know, if you're at a director level, make sure, you know, you're, you're engaging then at that director level, or if you've got a senior consultant in your team, let them engage with the senior consultant or the other team, avoid having your senior consultant directly engage with a director on the other side, especially if you're not going to be there. So try and just match things, match levels would probably be my, my, my simplest advice on that front. Great points. You've managed to um, summarize what six four hours of, of webinars into those four key points. Um, thank you for that. Um, Janendra, we I wanted to talk to you and, and also draw on Shiraz's points about um, hierarchy and the relationship aspect, which I think you also touched on earlier, because we often hear from a lot of companies that deal closure is what takes the most time um, in India. Um, what factors would you consider when it comes to closing a deal in India? What what pointers and what tips and what advice can you offer? Yeah, I think uh, it's a very valid point. Uh, as uh, Suraj rightly said, you know, the time, uh, spending more time building those kind of connections, understanding what is the uh, motivation for the other side to work with this side, um, probably identification of uh, various other factors like prices or probably what USP is being offered and asking questions because most of time um, all said and done, uh, probably Indian side would like to know more and probably even uh, culturally uh, it's, it's more polite culture where they they hesitate to say directly no. So probably even if, if they would like to go with the deal and if they are not, uh, 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 they would like to know more and probably not asking. So it's it's good to ask open-ended questions like whether uh, this makes sense or would there could be any add-ons and uh, things like that and probably offer um, helping them in their journey so so identifying a right partner could also be a good way to close deals because a uh, person on ground makes a lot of sense uh, for the business uh, because they can monitor what is happening around with uh, different projects or uh, in the, in case of tech company not necessarily they would like to have many people there but even a kind of overseeing uh, the project can help so coming back to that uh, uh, partners, maybe identifying a right partner could could be a good way to uh, come to a well uh, uh, a bigger market share, you know. Uh, so identifying those kind of partners who has more resources, more um, positive, you know, clientele and customer suppliers, etc. Uh, uh, because uh, Australian company all said and done, they they will be having different markets in their for uh, their. Uh, strategy so probably India could be one of the market but then it's a big market so having a right partner on ground can drive a lot of things to uh, have different deals because if, if you mention a deal there could be uh, several type of deal and several projects would be there there, there are many companies who will be looking for uh, multiple you know offerings so I think uh, those kind of ex industry experience, uh, having a right team in place uh, who can work with the stakeholders, et cetera, will be uh, crucial to make a good uh, business sense. And again, uh, uh, regulations and uh, legal side is also equally important. So India is evolving with a lot of uh, newer uh, things and probably to keep be on top of it, somebody has to be on ground or, or has to monitor it uh, very closely so that they don't make any mistake uh, while they are 
navigating the journey and probably agencies like TIQ and Austrade are best place to advise companies rightly. Thank you. Thank you, Janendra. That's the uh, a great segue into my next question to Paul. Um, Paul, you've obviously in in the time that you've been in India, you've obviously seen um, a huge transformation in the market and just general uh, nature of doing business and how that's evolved. Um, in relation to IP protection in particular, can you share your views on that, how that's evolved, and some of the strategies that you have applied? Uh, to navigate this challenge? Yeah, so, so from our side, uh, in terms of from a strategic perspective, what we've explored or steps that we've undertaken as a business uh, ha have been registering your IP, your patents, your trademarks, so you're actually protecting your business. Uh, and from there, um, looking at other things as well in terms of business name, um, looking at domain names and, and creating consistency across your brand. Uh, definitely, I guess, first and foremost, it, it is important to find a good IP trademark lawyer as well, who can give you or guide you with, with the best directions in terms of establishing all of that. And it depends if, if you're coming from Australia and expanding into India, um, you're probably looking at it more from a contractual agreement, depending where, where you've registered your IP's trademarks and, and whether you want to register those in, in India. And, and there are things like the Real Madrid Protocol and stuff like that, which enable you to register your trademarks across hundreds of jurisdictions. So definitely worthwhile getting the right advice from, from the right legal profession, professionals. And definitely, I guess with anything, um, finding someone who has that local understanding as well. Um, so that, that's quite critical. Um, but then also, so, so I mentioned, um, Sort of your IP, your trademarks, your patents, um, domain names, business names, um, but also going into security and making sure, like, if you've got code, are you protecting that, securing your systems, securing your digital assets, um, working with security providers, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of things that you do need to think about, uh, but I, I guess there's a starting point. And definitely, if you're expanding into a new market, it's talking to someone local who, who understands the local laws as well. Thank you. Um, that actually relates to one of the questions that we uh, received uh, before this event. Um, the question was in relation to business missions and whether there are any business missions um, in India. Um, and I'm actually going to take that question because the Austrade does have a business mission planned for the um, end of November um, to Bangalore and Delhi. And the purpose of this mission is to do exactly um, that, to help companies um, make those connections in the market and identify the right partners, identify the right legal partners, um, the right companies to, to work with. So I will put my um, email address uh, into this chat. So please reach out to me and I'd be happy to share the details of that business mission. Um, we've also seen another question on uh, in the chat from uh, Salil. Um, Salil, I can see that Amanda's responded to you um, with her email address. Um, I think that's actually, it might be best if we take that particular question offline and, and have that conversation. I can also connect you to Paula, um, happy to do that. Is there any other questions um, in the chat? Um, if anybody wants to, if any of the attendees want to unmute themselves um, and speak, you are most welcome to do that. Um, no other questions. Um, I think that was a very insightful and rich conversation today. Thank you to all the presenters for your time and for your insights. Um, I would just reiterate the point about um, spending time in market and fully immersing yourself and really navigating those challenges of finding the right partners um, building those relationships, um, you know, speaking to the legal agencies in market and, and addressing those IP and, and data protection concerns. Um, I will quote Shane Elliott again, um, <laughs> with a, and he says, 
With a country developing and changing so quickly, each visit to India is an eye opener and you very quickly learn that your preconceptions are out of date. And I think that's kind of, that just sums up the conversation that we've had today. Um, and again, this is just the beginning. So I, I'd urge all the attendees to stay in touch with, with us and we can continue to explore how we can service um, your companies individually.